A series of papers published in the BMJ during the 1940s established the methodology for the modern randomized controlled clinical trial, the real gold standard for the assessment of evidence-based medicine. A key figure in that story was John Crofton. So, hello. I had the great pleasure in this film of meeting him, now in his late 90s. What were the key features of this trial, the streptomycin trial, that make people point to it as being a turning point in the because, development of trial methodology? Well, because it, it, it was the first really famous international. Uh, the, I, I think the NCHAM was told me that before the war there'd been one or two international trials on malaria, and certainly Philip Darcy Hart had done a controlled trial, I think, during the war on some sort of drug for the common cold. Patulin. Patulin, that's right. Mm -hmm. But the, the one exception, it, it didn't have randomised distribution. Mm -hmm. So this was the first really well controlled trial. And of course, that caused a lot of interest. I mean, well, John Crofton's involvement in controlled trials really begins in the North African desert during the Second World War, where he worked with um, a doctor called Guy Scadding who was already doing controlled trials on the soldiers in the, the tented hospital that he was responsible for. And after the war, John Crofton came back to this country where Guy Scadding was in a very prominent position at the Brompton Hospital, and he recruited him to work on the MRC streptomycin trial. So his introduction to controlled trials came very early on in the British history of controlled trials. We were originally going to treat everybody for six months. But when they became sort of baby resistant, they, I think they cut it down to three months because they then decided this wasn't going to be a major contribution to treatment of TB. Hmm. It might enable patients to have operations of their chest because they all went wrong, you know, previously, that, that if they could get a temporary control, then they wouldn't get secondary yes. TB infection. TB was a dreadful disease in those days. Some forms of it could kill people very quickly indeed. And when a drug, streptomycin, was found, that was a fantastic breakthrough. So when the drug was first used, it was used to treat these very serious cases of tuberculosis. But there was doubt about how well it worked in pulmonary tuberculosis. So it was decided that a trial should be done to find out how good it was in pulmonary tuberculosis, and that's one of the reasons that the trial got done. The idea of using streptomycin to, yeah. to treat TB, was that, uh, did that come from America? Well, the basis of that was penicillin had been such a dramatic success that everyone was looking for something of the same kind. And, and of course it was quite different. Patients didn't develop penicillin resistance while they were having the drug. Becoming resistant to the drug you were using, that was new with streptomycin. And, you know, well, it's sad. What would you see as the, the, the highlights of these 18 papers in the BMJ you described? Can you recall the papers you're most proud of? This is, that, that's the one about resistance. The one on resistance, that's 1948. 1948, mm -hmm. yes. John Crofton's real contribution was founded on the basis of his understanding about how to test treatments in a valid way. So when he went from London to Edinburgh, to take up the chair of respiratory medicine there. He knew about the research methods that would be required to address, for example, different treatment regimens, whether people had to be treated in hospital or not, what you needed to do about drug resistance. And it was a combination of applying those principles and an obsessional investigation of the development of drug resistance in individual patients that led to a fantastic achievement. The achievement was that from a situation in Edinburgh where there was one of the highest rates of tuberculosis in Europe, he and his colleagues achieved a 100% success in curing the disease. There were obviously enormous improvements in chemotherapy of tuberculosis during the 40s and the 50s, John, mm. largely as a result of your work. Uh, what's happened subsequently? You know, our TB went down, so... Uh, uh, I, I couldn't really do research there and got involved with the uh, International Union. And there we did this trial in 20, 23 countries. We also did the first 
international study of whether drug resistance was important, we did it in 12 countries with Noel Rees. And he did, looked at the, the lab techniques and found they were very, very... Mm -hmm. There was no other international trial till the early 1990s. Do you think that medicine now is very much more securely based on evidence, on scientific and clinical evidence, than it was when you started in medicine? Certainly. There was really very little scientific background to medicine until after the war. And, and do you think that the major advances in applying evidence in medicine have come from laboratory work, from the great advances in cell biology, molecular biology, or from, from clinical observations and clinical trials? Well, I, th I think clinical trials. I mean, the basic things, of course, are extremely exciting, uh, well, DNA and so on. Potentially, there's probably much more lab stuff in the future. At the moment, there are more contributions from control trials. The streptomycin trial that was eventually published in the BMJ in 1948 is generally regarded as a landmark. Uh, the report of the trial is wonderfully clear. It's quite a long report, but it's very well written. And so um, it was a landmark in that sense and is widely regarded as a landmark. Crofton not only showed that streptomycin was an effective treatment for tuberculosis, but in doing so, developed all of those techniques of randomization, of blinding, and so on, which are the basis of, of all randomized controlled trials these days. <laughs>